It's a pleasure to be here. This is, I think, the favorite audience I have ever spoken to. Uh, I want to talk to you about something very close to your heart. What makes a great eating experience and what makes a memory for a great eating experience? And one thing I want to point out right at the beginning is that your memory for an experience is quite, from the content of the experience, is quite different from your memory of how you felt about that experience. You, I, I can promise you that three months from now, when somebody asks me about this visit, we had a, a wonderful, basically nine-hour banquet, those of us who are speaking here on Saturday, uh, where, where various chefs cooked different things for us. And I'm going to say that was an incredible day. And somebody said, I said, it was just one of the great days. And people are going to say, well, what did you eat? And I'm going to say, ooh, let's see. What did I eat? Oh, yes, there was this and yeah, that. But I mean, I eat about 12 different things. And I won't remember most of them, but I remember it was great. And in fact, the second meal, the second best meal I ever ate, which was in 1986 at the French restaurant Girardet, uh, I don't remember more than one or two of the 15 dishes I ate. I remember the people I was with, I remember the wonderful feeling of it, but I don't remember all the food. So we can separate how good we feel about an experience from the actual content of the experience. Now, in that regard, I decided to ask a bunch of Americans, a reasonably good sample, what was the best meal of your life? Or if not, one of the best meals of your life? And here is what we find out from them. First of all, virtually everyone mentions the main course. Only 23% mentioned an appetizer. Only 23% mentioned dessert. This is the best meal of their life. Only 18% mentioned the beverage. Only 40% mentioned the social setting, who they were eating with. Um, only 15% mentioned the ambience, the environment, the scenery, and something of that sort. 52% of the best meals were in restaurants. The rest of them were in homes. 25% of them mentioned steak as the main course of the uh, meal. Now, I want to actually... This, this is what people are carrying away from their best meal, and I want you to get a sense of this, so I'm going to give you a couple of meals. Here's one meal that somebody, this is a pretty representative meal, maybe 30% of the people. Number, subject number 181. I would have to say that one of the best meals I have had in my life was when I was in Dallas, Texas. It was a very nice place with just the right lighting, and it was my first time in Texas meeting a very good friend of mine. The service was great, and the lighting was just right. Also, the sounds were not too loud, so we could talk to each other and catch up on old times. I remember ordering a steak, and it was just flavored so right and tasted so good, I think I could have ate two of them. It was a very pleasant meal, and I had a great time. <laughs> you will notice how little food is in this second meal. Every Christmas Eve, my Italian grandfather and Greek grandmother would cook a meal consisting of creamy carbonara with bacon pieces throughout, homemade spinach pie, and sausage. It was always amazing. Different type of best meal. Third, I think one of the best meals was when I ordered a pepperoni pizza and a buffalo chicken pizza <laughs> at one of my favorite places. I couldn't decide which one to order, so I ordered both and ate almost both of them. Number four, oh, I think if I was being executed, this might be my final meal. <laughs> Next meal. The best meal I have ever had in my life was when I got out of jail. <laughs> Having been in jail for three years and eating prison food was horrible. When I got out, I got a Hardee's Frisco burger combo meal. That was the best burger and fries I have ever had. Now remember, these are Americans. Yeah. Um, and finally, the most American of all, had almost all the nutrition that's needed for human survival. <laughs> Protein, vitamin, fat, carbs, minerals, that's an all-in-one meal. It consisted of the best salad I ever had, various beverages, roasted chicken, roasted turkey, steak misspelled, and rice. <laughs> now, this is actually a pretty good picture of the 200 meals. Um, and I just want to say that it's really quite surprising to me, first of all, how little food the people remember, and secondly, how often they don't talk about who they were eating with. Um, now, 
I'm getting this data from France right now. I, don't, I was hoping to have it for us. It's going to look very different, I'm sure. Here is some data that Claude Fischer and I collected from France. And we asked people, what do you think the, the relation of the food and body are like? And the reason I'm telling you this is because culture is such an important uh, a component of what a good meal is. And we gave people a choice. It could be like a tree taking nutrients from the soil and so on, a car or a factory where you know, something comes in, is processed and comes out, or a temple uh, giving an offering to a temple. And you notice the majority of French people think of food and body as the same kind of relationship as a tree. The majority of Americans, and by the way, British too, think it's more like a car or a factory. <laughs> now, that suggests a cultural difference of some significance. Now, one of the most important things about meals is the people we eat them with and the, sh and the, and the sharing of them. And that's why I was surprised that a majority of the Americans didn't mention this. Uh, the greatest meal of my life was a uh, courtesy of Farhan Adria, and here we are sitting before the meal, with the five of us who were jo at that meal, and that meal, which I will talk about a number of times today, uh, is that was with these people. These people are part of that meal. We talked about the meal on the hour drive leaving. Uh, the, the, uh, th this is an integral part, the commensality of eating, something that Claude Fischler has written about, how important commensality is in eating, the joining of pleasures, the discussion of the food. Now, um, there are, I want to emphasize something that most of you probably have not thought of, and that is the contrast between experiencing a meal and remembering a meal because those are not the same things. And we ask people the following questions. Think of a positive experience like going to a, a favorite sports event or a concert or a meal. We can talk about three aspects of this experience. First is the anticipation of the experience. You had the ticket and enjoyed thinking about going. Second is the actual experience of the event when you are attending it. Third is the memories of the event, remembering the different things that happened. This could be immediately after the event or days or months or years later. Generally, how important do you think anticipation, experience, and memory are for you in your life? Rank the three. This is data from Americans, um, American adults. 22% think that the anticipation of a great event is the most important thing. 48% that the experience, and 29% the memory. In other words, people differ a lot in how they evaluate these things. Now, this is particularly important because um, I will illustrate it with this example. We asked this following question to people. This was asked to French and American people. When I go to my favorite restaurant, I choose to order A, my favorite item on the menu, or B, a new item that I have never tried. Which would you prefer? Some people prefer A, some people prefer B. Let's look at the analysis of that. In terms of anticipation, if you get a new food at your favorite restaurant, you're looking forward to it, but you're not sure it's gonna be really good because not everything is very good, even at a very good restaurant. So there's a little risk involved. On the other hand, if it's your favorite food, you're really looking forward to it because you know it's gonna be good, right? So your anticipation is clearer. If we look at the experience, your new food, it'll be a positive experience because it's a good restaurant, but it's variable. It might not be so good. After all, your favorite food is probably one of the best foods for you at the restaurant. Whereas if you're getting your favorite food, you're going to have a great experience. But now let's look at memory. If you get a new food, you have a distinct new positive memory. This is in my library of memories of wonderful foods. If you get your favorite food, you won't remember anything. It's the tenth time you've had it, and it doesn't, you don't remember the ten times you've had the same dish. It's just one memory. So if you want to create memories, you want to order something new. If you want to maximize experience, you want to order something you really love. Now, the problem is more complicated because from work by Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winning psychologist and economist, um, it turns out that your memories of things are very different from your actual experience. And Kahneman has identified three features. Of, these are of negative memories, so we have to convert them. These are memories of people who experience pain. They put their hand in ice water for a period of time, it's painful, and then they take it out. And, when they f and that, what, that's, what you've got is time go going from left to right, and that, that square thing up there means that's the amount of pain you feel. 
And one thing that Kahneman found is that surprisingly, if you, if you warm the water up slightly before you take their hand out, so they get a little more pain, but it gets gradually less. And then you ask people, how painful was that episode? The people say it's less painful when the pain graded off gradually, even though they experienced a total amount more pain. Because instead of pulling their hand out, they had it cool down slowly, uh, warm up slowly. Secondly, the peak is critical. So if you give somebody an experience like in the bottom line, this is a classic of the dentist's office, right, where you're sitting there and nothing happens, and suddenly you get a pain. There's only a second or two of pain, but that dominates your experience of the dentist. So what Kahneman points out is that the end and the peak are critical for negative experiences. If we convert this to positive experiences, it probably means the opposite. That is to say, the peak is very important in how you remember. How, when I say how you remember, how much you liked it. Not the details, just how, how good was that or how, how painful was that experience. But in the case of the positive, the equivalent of this should be that a sharp stop should be the best. There's something very good that just turns off should be remembered as more positive than something that gradually dies down. Now, there's another very important principle that came up called duration neglect. And that has to do with the fact that if you put your hand in ice water for 30 seconds or for a minute, and then we ask you later, how bad was the pain? You give the same answer. You don't, your, your mind does not actually include time in its calculation. You remember, ooh, my hand was cold in the water, and that was bad, and you give it a bad rating. Now, uh, if we turn to meals, we've done this experiment with a Chinese, a set of five, uh, five Chinese dishes from a not very good Chinese restaurant, which had a big buffet of many different foods, and we had people come and try every food in the restaurant and rate how much they liked it, each food. And then we composed the meal for each person based on how much they liked the food. And in this particular meal, the meal is getting better and better. That is, food one, they didn't like as much as food two, they liked food three more, food four more, and so on. Now, it turns out, in one set of meals, they got their favorite food at the end, number five, and the other group, of, it's actually the same person at different times, got the fifth food, but they got twice as much of it. They got two portions of their favorite food. So they had twice as much time eating their favorite food. And of course, they had a better food experience because they ate more of their favorite food. When we ask them after the meal to rate how good the meal is, it's exactly the same from those two people. Exactly the same. So that Two little scoops of caviar or four little scoops of caviar, in your memory, it's the caviar that you were eating. Doesn't matter how much you're eating. That says something, by the way, in favor of tasting menus, of course. Um, now, um, if we talk about memory in general, there are a few principles. So, in other words, we want to talk about two things how much you liked an experience and how much you remember of the content of the experience. What you remember of the content. From what we know about memory, the first thing is the thing you tend to remember best. That's called the primacy effect. You remember things that are repeated more. Therefore, there probably is not duration neglect for remembering what you ate, as opposed to how good it was. And we remember things that make sense together, that cluster together, that are the same kind of thing, that are variations. The best example, of course, this would be a story. We remember that well because the parts fit together and you can reconstruct the story. Now, if we ask people, this is, I don't have the data from Fancy. What's your favorite course? Uh, most people say the main course. And the interesting thing is 68%. And the interesting thing about that is that the main course, of course, is in the middle of the meal. Uh, the data we have suggests that your memory is best for what's first. Your feeling about the meal is best for what's last. But they remember best what's in the middle. Now, let's talk just a minute about beginnings. The reason that the first dish is very important is it sets the stage for your meal. It tells people what to expect. How good is this going to be? What kind of a meal is this? What should I be paying attention to? A surprise in the first meal, in the first dish, is very good because people remember things that are unusual. But of course, it's only a surprise once. The only reason you enjoy a surprise a second time is because if you're with somebody else who hasn't had that surprise, and then you're going to enjoy their experiencing their surprise. So here we start with an early part of a meal at El Bulli. Out comes the liquid nitrogen, the uh, lime, uh, and, the da and the rum, and we have a frozen daiquiri. And this, was, this just was like a shot out of 
out of nowhere. I mean, this was, wow, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. It was a surprise. It was delicious, and it was a surprise. Other things, uh, I think El Bulli, uh, uh, Farinadria, uh, uh, somehow incorporates a lot of the principles of psychology that I'm talking about without necessarily studying them, as many chefs do without studying cuisine per se. Here's another dish. Now, this, is, this was a, uh, a, 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 a melon gel made to look like caviar, and it was, it was not only delicious, but it was charming. It was cute. It was funny in a, in a, in a, uh, in a caviar made of melon, and again, memorable because it was unusual and amusing. A third dish that is, was highly, this is my favorite dish, Ferran, of everything I've had, I think, in my life. And this was uh, a, an extract of pine nuts, which, which, uh, which was quite aromatic, steaming hot in the bottom of a glass, but the to top of the glass is iced. So when you drink it, it's cold, but, when, but, but you get the aroma of something hot. You have never had the experience of something that's cold and aromatic before. Cold suppresses aroma. And so this was a totally new kind of experience, something that wakes you up and says, oh, I'll remember that. Now let's take a look at the meal. Having taken a look at a little of El Bulli, this is a typical American diner menu. Oh, the Ameri this is a special form of meal that only Americans have. You can buy anything in a diner. This is only part of the menu. <laughs> and this is a, the American style. I will have exactly what I want. I don't care what you want. And not only that, here's the table, and you can see that you can have sugar, you can add sugar, you can add salt, you can add pepper. Every they usually have oil and hot stuff. You're basically cooking at the table. I mean, basically, when the French go to dinner, they say, I'm going to the chef. The chef is going to make good food for me. That's why I'm paying. In America, you say, I'm going to cook at this table. Now, that's an unusual form of meal. Let's look at something. Well, the, very common in the United States is the buffet, a salad bar. Again, what you are doing is you are composing your meal, okay? And in some restaurants, you compose the whole meal, not just the salad. Now, in the traditional Western meal, which I guess comes from France in the last few hundred years, it's a three-course meal. Each diner orders from a, a choice, appetizer, main course, dessert. There's potential sharing because you're ordering different things, so you can share food, and sharing food is a very bonding activity. And it's less common to talk about the food because you're not eating the same thing. You're eating the veal, I'm eating the fish. Um, if we ask Americans, when you eat a meal, we're talking about the main course now, it's meat, potatoes, vegetables, how do you eat the meal? The actual, this is the microstructure of the meal. You see, 14% so eat their favorite food first, 39% eat their favorite food last, and 46% mixed. Some of the mixed people rotate, one, two, three, one, two, three, others just eat a little of this. I don't even know what they do, some of them. They just do it. But you see, people are determining this but for themselves. Now, Audrey, again, has, uh, has taken this a step further because he has not only told us, arranged the order of courses, he's told us how to eat the course to maximize our experience. So here is a, a delicious sushi with a little spray there, and that's a ginger spray. And what you do is you spray the ginger in your mouth first, coating your mouth with ginger, and then you eat the sushi. Now, that's a totally different, the normal experience of eating sushi is you get the ginger while you're eating the sushi. This changes the order. But in other words, Audrey has, has said to us, this is an optimal order for eating. I'm not just going to have you decide by, at random what to eat, what to put on your mouth. I'm going to tell you because I've, I've thought of this. I know this food. Okay, now, um, there's very little known about... Um, about uh, the theory of cuisine, but just let me say first that um, in the modern tasting meal, which most of you now do, which is becoming the modern meal for good restaurants, 10 to 15, say, courses, what happens is you don't do any ordering. The chef orders for you, and you all eat the same thing at the same time, which means you can talk about the food because you're eating the same thing. Conversational focus, though there isn't sharing, of course, because there's nothing to share. Okay, now I want to talk a little about the parallel to music between going to a concert and eating a meal. 
They're both about two hours long. Maybe, well, in El Bulli it's more than two hours, but say two hours, most concerts are two hours long. Both of them are nonverbal. That is to say, it's very hard to describe for someone your meal in detail. Now, what was, the, what was the fish like when you said it was, you know, it was tender and it had a sort of a, a gentle spice. Maybe you know that there was ginger in the spice. When people say, how was the Mozart? You say, oh, it was terrific. You say, well, well what do you mean? They say, well, it, it was great. I mean, you know, you don't have the vocabulary to describe the Mozart. Okay. Um, when you go to a concert, it is like going to El Bulli. You don't say, I want to hear the second movement of the Jupiter Symphony first. You say, I'm going to the concert, and Mozart is going to tell me what to listen to. Not only is Mozart going to tell me what movements, he's going to tell me what notes to listen to first. I have nothing to do with it. I say, I'm in Mozart's hands. Why shouldn't you be in Mozart's hands? He's better than you are. <laughs> now, there's no theory, really, about cuisine. There is a bit of a theory written in a book by my for my late wife, Elizabeth Rosen, the Flavor Principle Cookbook, in which she tries to describe what makes food Chinese, what makes food uh, uh, Mexican. It talks about the flavorings and the techniques that are used so that you could say, using this book, if I wanted to cook potatoes, Chinese style, they don't really eat potatoes much, but here's how you would do it. You'd use soy sauce, ginger root, you would um, stir fry, and so on. There is a lot of music theory. The trouble with music theory is music theory from the point of view of cuisine, is about scores. It's about the study of musical scores. It's like if you were studying recipes. Studying recipes is not what you want to make culinary theory about. You want to study eaters and the experience that they have with food. There's very little music theory about that. My son, Alexander Rosen, who was the person who was eating the uh, uh, ginger there, is a music theorist and a molecular gastronomer. He became a molecular gastronomer at that very meal that I showed you uh, from El Bulli. He does a lot of cooking, but he also works in music theory. And his music theory is about what does the listener take from the music? Why is Mozart engaging the listener? Not what's in the score, but what's in the head of the listener. That's what we need. So let me now review for you. Here is a typical classical music concert. We start with a Mozart overture, Le Nozze di Figaro. Then we do Mozart's, this is a very good concert, very good music, Jupiter Symphony, four movements, Allegro Vivace, Andante Cantabile, Minuetto, Molto Allegro. It ends with a five-part fugal coda. We have an intermission, which, by the way, at Albuli, there was an intermission where we moved from the outside of the restaurant to the inside in the middle of the meal. And then we have Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, Allegro, Andante, Scherzo, Allegro, coda. Two things I want to point out. The, the, both of these pieces and most classical symphonies end with a coda. They end with a bang. They know intuitively that how something ends really affects how much you like it. I want to make this as a comment now because we typically end the meal with the dessert, which is not the coda food. The dessert is not usually, in most people's view, the best part of the meal. But in music, you end with a bang. In meals, we typically do not, even in modern meals. The other thing I want to mention, interestingly enough, is if, if you look at these two symphonies, and these are typical symphonies of the classical romantic period, it's the first and the last movement that people like most, and that are the most uh, engaging and dynamic. Isn't that interesting that in the classical musical style, you start and end with the best things? Maybe there's something to be learned for that from us, for us. So here is, in the cultural evolution of the concert, we started with what I showed you, Overture, Symphony 1, Symphony 2. You could call it a nine-part menu, if you like, structured. And we end up now with, in modern pop music with the album, which is about ten things, more like a tasting menu. The things are four minutes long, typically. And by the way, the best piece of music is usually at the beginning. And one of the best is usually at the end. So the music people have this idea that we might want to pick up on, that it's the beginning and the end of the meal that are the most potent for what you take away from the meal. Let's now look at the cultural evolution of the Western meal. It's the same, right? We have gone from appetizer, main course, dessert, to 10 or so separate dishes. And, but we've kept one piece of the classical meal. Dessert is still sort of at the end in most cases. We had this wonderful banquet uh, that the chefs made uh, on Saturday. 
It ended with a dessert. The dessert was okay, but it wasn't up to the rest of the meal. And I'm not even sure. I was, I was ready to not have one. But, you know, it's so traditional that we do that. Okay, so I want to just give you a few applications of this. Um, here's a meal that my son, my son and his colleague Frank Mosca make banquets once a month for people, about 20 people. This is a piece of a meal that had 15 courses, but I want to show you something about it that comes partly from the fact that my son's a music theorist. Notice that the meal starts with rose petal sorbet, ends with plum clove float. It's symmetrical. Notice that the second dish is heirloom tomatoes five ways. The next to last dish is summer peaches five ways. This meal has got an aesthetic structure to it. I don't know that people appreciate this, but they impose the structure on the meal so that the beginning and the end are related to each other. Not the precise foods, but the way that the foods are prepared. Here is, here's the tomato dish. That, it starts with a, you eat it in order. Uh, he learned from Ferran Adria to tell people what order to eat it in. You start with an heirloom tomato, and you go around the table, ending up with the gazpacho at the top. As you eat it, the tomato becomes less and less salient. It's the story of the transformation of a tomato. At the end of the meal, we have the same thing with peach. We have a roasted peach with salted ice cream at the beginning, and we end up with the equivalent of a peach gazpacho at the end. So that there is a structure that people can... I remember this well because it had this structural feature. Now, I just want to then close with a couple of ideas. One is, we should question. I'm, I'm asking, I'm going to present you with questions, not answers. One question. Should we put dessert at the end of meals? Is there a reason, except for the European tradition of, of recent centuries, to put dessert at the end, if it is not the favorite dish? Open question. Should we... One of the things that's very, very salient in great music that is not present at all in, in wonderful cuisine is repetition. Isn't it reasonable to serve the same dish or a slight variation of that dish twice? Maybe once near the beginning, once near the end. You love that dish. Don't you want to go away with the memory of that dish? Music, if you think of sonata form in music, you're playing, you're playing with two themes for 10, 15 minutes. You play them, you vary them, and then you recapitulate them. Boy, does that improve memory. Should we worry more when we make a meal about how, how much people are enjoying the meal when they have it, or how long, or how much, the, how they're going to remember it? Famous story of, of Martin Seligman, a friend of mine, a very distinguished psychologist, goes to Berlin for a meeting, wants to have a great meal, he likes good food, goes to Ilhauser, a, a three-star Michelin restaurant 20 years ago, in Alsace, he has two dinners there, spends two days at the inn. He wants to make sure that he remembers this meal and he's wakeful for it. So he asks a friend for, a pharmacologist for a drug so that he can take it to sleep on the plane over. So he gets a good night. Takes Adervin. He sleeps well, has his meal in Berlin, in uh, Alsace. Sometime later, one of his friends in Berlin who was with him at the dinner says, you owe me for the wine. And Marty says, what wine? Marty is totally amnesic for five days. He, the drug made him amnesic for five days. He has absolutely no memory of these two wonderful meals that he had had. So here's a case of someone who's lost his memory for a meal and therefore has lost something. People remember narratives with endings better than they remember things that don't have endings. Should, we, should there be some kind of a theme that runs through a meal with an ending of some sort, some kind of a conclusion? And... Finally, I won't have time to talk about this. How do we parse a meal? How can we get a second beginning in a meal by, for example, as an albuli, moving from one room to another? Maybe you can have a second beginning. So I want to tell you, chefs, I would love to collaborate with you and to get information from you, from your patrons, through their email, which they would give you after the dinner, if they're willing, about what they had at the dinner, what they remember, how much they liked it, and a month later, how they feel about that meal and what they would tell other people about that meal. Because you want to know that. Of course, it's good for your business when somebody says, I had a great meal at X. That's what you want them to say, and you want them to learn a little bit too. Now, I, and my final point is that I feel that one country is not as well represented here as it might be, and that's France. And that's and particularly because France has been the, the champion of great cuisine for some hundreds of years. And I feel that as an American, we are now 
you know, becoming not so much the number big, big number one only country in the world. We're in a bit of a decline, and it may be that this new movement in cuisine is going to take some of the uh, prestige away from France. So I want to put in a good word for the French because they make wonderful food. And here is my good word for the French. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, manger. <laughs> Thank you. Great, um, a, a wonderfully inventive talk about um, the, uh, the, the chef as Mozart or food as a symphony. And of course, the thing about a music performance is there's always an encore. And Paul, your encore is to answer some questions. Just a tiny bit of quiet, that would be great. Tiny bit of quiet for Paul's encore. We have a question over here. Is it an encore or a moose bouche? Yes. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I wanted to ask you a little bit about vocabulary and the idea of vocabulary. And you didn't say much about it, but vocabulary strikes me as an important way of moving from the experience to the memory. Yes. And sometimes with food, it can be devilishly difficult to articulate what made it taste so good. So I was wondering if you could elab elaborate a little bit on that. And yes. as a second half thought, I was wondering if you'd had any chance to ask chefs about their experiences of remembering an experience because their vocabulary yeah. is pretty developed. Okay, let me answer your second question first. I have not interviewed chefs, and boy, would I love to. And if there's a way to do that, this is the audience for it. Just get in touch with me, please. Uh, now, as far as the, 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 the vocabulary of taste and smell and flavor is very impoverished. We have very few words, uh, and it, it, it comes up particularly in wine, where people to try to describe wines that they've drunk. And it's, uh, Adrian Lehrer has shown that even wine experts, when they describe a wine, and you give people a few wines to drink, let's say three red wines, different grapes, you, they, they describe the wines without mentioning the grape, but with words. And then you give their descriptions to three other experts, and you say, which wine is which? They have a lot of trouble picking out the three wines, even though people who know wines are describing. So one of the problems is you eat a meal at a restaurant, or you go to a concert, and you really cannot uh, capture the experience of it. Now, I take pictures of all the foods I eat as a little memory, and that helps. But it's very difficult. Our vocabulary, in, in, I think, in all languages, is very limited. In fact, e interestingly enough, the most important word for eating experience is flavor. Flavor is a merge of taste in the mouth, things that come into the nose, and the experience in your mouth. Many languages, including German, by the way, do not have a word for flavor. They have a word for taste and smell. We in English have a word for flavor. In French, we have saveur. But in, in many languages do not have a word for it. So we, we don't even have a word for the experience of strawberry, which is both a mouth and a nose experience. So the answer is, yes, you can learn. You can learn to what, what wine experts can do and what good Culinary people can do and say, there is, I taste some ginger in here. There's a little chocolatey taste. They can identify some of the components. That's a big step. The average person cannot do that. The average person can name only about three odors, believe it or not. Chocolate, coffee, and maybe one other. They can't even identify orange odor when they sniff it. So the average person who's eating at a good restaurant is not, doesn't have a vocabulary. And could we teach it to some degree, but smell and taste are very hard to describe. Okay, do we have a, a question here from Simon? Um, Paul, I mean, obviously your research is, is mass market America. What I would be love to know is with this audience, whether there's a difference in terms of favoritism for the appetizer, the main course and dessert, because those findings seem to be very different from what I've talked with people here about, whether they prefer the first course, the main course, or the dessert? What do you think? The answer is, first of all, I, I had hoped to have the French data for today. We started collecting it two weeks ago. Uh, we don't have it yet. Uh, we're going to get French. I tend to work in four places, India, Japan, France, and the United States. Those are, represent a whole different kinds of things, but mostly in France with Claude Fischler, who was supposed to be here but has had an illness in his family, so I'm not sure he can make it. Um, so the answer is I'll have the French data for you. It, I personally it, prefer appetizers. I, I mean, is it possible to do it here with this audience, to ask this audience? Yes, why don't so we do it right first? now? 
Favorite course, appetizer, main course, or dessert? Appetizer. Main course. Dessert. Okay, appet uh, appetizer clearly wins, and I point out that the tasting menu is a menu of appetizers. When I go to a, a regular restaurant, I typically order two or three appetizers instead of ordering an appetizer in a main course. Time for one last question here. Thank Paul. you for asking that. I, it was a good vote. Paul, that was fascinating, and I think out of that, I now understand why Dave Chang serves a big slab of pork at the end of the meal at Momo Fukusiobo in Sydney. It's kind of it turned everything on its head and it has an enormous emotional impact. I, um, I love the music metaphor and I'm a big fan of Oliver Sacks' book, Musicophilia, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. its relationship, how music impacts us emotionally and heals yes. us and does all this nurturing. Do you think that food has the same emotional impact and effect that music can have or in, and that we're just not putting the melody together right? Is that the argument? Yes, I think food has much of the, I think the, the, the meal and the concert have much in common. There's, and with modern cuisine, especially the aesthetic aspect of food has increased, making it more like uh, traditional music. Uh, and I think that both of them have great emotional effects. Uh, pa basically, people feel really good after eating a really good meal. I mean, you feel good for quite a while. And then you have the memory, of course.